The following program is sponsored by friends and partners of Kingdom Connection. We have heard the sound. Our eyes have seen the light. We found the edge and pushed beyond. We are no longer afraid. You can find us breaking down walls, building foundations, leading the way and loving every moment. I don't want substitutes. We're living in an hour of substitutes in the body of Christ. And we think we can substitute the anointing of the Holy Spirit for other things when there is nothing that will get the job done like the anointing. Exodus chapter 30, verse 23. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take for yourselves quality spices. Some Bible translations say principal spices. One translation says the best spices. And then he lists five different kinds. And then in verse 24, he gives the quantity of, of how much. He says you are to take a hen of olive oil. That is five quarts of olive oil and put five ingredients into it. And it will become the anointing oil. Verse 29, you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them. Verse 31, and you shall speak to the children of Israel saying, listen, you may think, well, that was back then for there, them and there, saying this shall be a holy anointing oil to me, that's God speaking, throughout your generations. I want you to do this from generation to to generation. It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it. I don't want it substituted. I want it to be the real thing. According to its composition, it's holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, some translations say a stranger, shall be cut off from his people. I remembered a message that impacted my life. I don't remember every detail or even specific points of the sermon, but the title that this particular preacher, a famous preacher of days gone by, who uh, has gone on to be with the Lord, his name was Ray H. Hughes, Dr. Ray H. Hughes. He preached a sermon that became very famous to a generation of preachers before my generation, like my dad and, and others. And that sermon was called, The Anointing Makes the Difference. The Anointing Makes the Difference. How many of you know there's a difference between singing and anointed singing? There's a difference between preaching and anointed preaching. There's a difference between having church and having an anointed church service. Because the anointing makes the difference. And I want, to, I want to steal his title. Because I believe that is what will make the difference in your life. You know, if you're a business person, we think the anointing is just for people in the ministry. But the anointing makes the difference in the marketplace. The anointing will make your gift and, and the call of God and the gifts of God on your life become powerful and fruitful. What makes us effective is the anointing. 1 John 2 and verse 20 says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. And that unction that you have received of him, that anointing abides within you. When the anointing is upon someone, there is an unction behind you. There is, we, we, we used to, I used to preach a sermon when I was an evangelist and I called it the unction to function. Amen. And there's something about the anointing that gives you the unction. It quickens you. It causes you to have the ability to do something. It graces you. The anointing, the word anoint means to smear on or to rub on. That's what we will do. We will, we will take the anointing oil and touch and smear on or rub on. And that anointing will have a fragrance and a smell. It's amazing to me that he said you are to take a hen of oil, which is five quarts of oil, or six quarts, six quarts of oil. 
There's a symbolic message that when they would anoint in the, in the Bible days, they would pour six quarts of this anointing oil. And it wasn't just a little mercy drop from heaven. It wasn't just a little dab would do you. It wasn't just a little smear and maybe put a little dot on their head or a cross with oil. But they poured six quarts of oil. Read Psalms 133. The Bible said the oil flowed down Aaron's hair, down past his beard, onto his garment, down to his feet. He was drenched in the anointing. And I believe that there is a need today in the church for that kind of anointing. We don't need little mercy drops. We don't need, we're not fighting smaller things. We're fighting bigger things than we've ever fought before. And there's an anointing that the Bible talks about in Joel that said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. I'm not going to just touch you or, or momentarily bless you. I want there to be a saturation of the anointing. I want you to be drenched in the anointing. I want you to have an anointing upon your life. It's not just for preachers and prophets. It's for every one of you. And he said, you can be anointed. I love the fact that he said that when you anoint, you are to, you are to have fresh oil. Listen to this verse, Psalms 92 and verse 10. He said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. There's a lot of people in the church today who are stale in their anointing. They're stale in what God is doing in their life because it's an old anointing. It was something that happened way back there in some service a long time ago. And that's when, you know, that's when the Bible talks about that the, that there are flies in the ointment. There's a verse that actually says that if you don't have fresh oil, the flies are attracted to that, anoint, that, that ointment that you have in you. And we have to have a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit. I love the fact that we can we don't have to be repulsive. We don't have to come. There's that old smell of religion that gets on us sometimes. And we're just doing church. And the old machine clanks on. And it's just another Sunday. And it's just another church. And it's just another singing. And it's just another sermon. But when the freshness of the anointing comes, when the touch of the anointing comes, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes, there's a freshness to it. There's a quickening to it. There's an anointing on it. I love that he said the anointing can do what other things cannot do. When the anointing is there, it begins to permeate the atmosphere. When the woman broke open the alabaster box and anointed Jesus' feet, the aroma of that anointing permeated the atmosphere. There's something about the anointing that when it fills a room, there is an there is the odor of the anointing. And I, I don't mean a physical smell, but spiritually the atmosphere, the aroma of the anointing when it feels. When somebody gets up and sings a song, the atmosphere changes. When that word is anointed, it begins to change the atmosphere. There's a sweetness there. Psalm 72 and verse 11 said, He shall come down as rain on mowed down fresh grass. You ever walked outside after it rained and the grass had just been cut? There is an aroma. That's what the anointing is like. When it comes, you can smell the rose of Sharon. You can smell the lily of the valley. There's a sweetness. There's something about, there's something that comes on us when we sense and feel the anointing. Psalms 45 and 8 said, Your garments do smell of myrrh and cassia in the ivory palaces, and it makes us glad. I believe that when that high priest, after being poured six quarts of oil, walked home and he had to go home in that same outfit. Can you imagine? And he's sloshing, walking through the camp and somebody's sitting over in a tent and probably watching TV and, and, and suddenly the anointed man of God walks by and they don't see him, but somebody turns in the tent and says, what's that smell? And they walk, look outside and they say, that's the, that's the anointed man of God. There's an anointing on his life. He's leaving anointed footprints. We need oily footprints. We need 
need an anointing on our life. And it's not that we have to go around and say, I'm anointed, I'm anointed, look at me. But I'm telling you, when we leave this sanctuary today, God can so anoint us that when you go back on the job, when your kids go into school, when they go off to universities, people, they don't know what to call it, but they say there's something different about you. There's something unusual about you. What is it about you? What do you, do, do you do yoga? What is it about you? You have a peace about you. You have a contentment about you. You have an authority about you. It's called the anointing. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful that it's available to us today. The anointing. He said in verse 32 that the anointing. Don't you know there's a difference when you get in an anointed service? Moses got anointed and he had to put a veil over his face because he was shining with the glory of God. Stephen got so anointed that the Bible said that when he stood to preach, they couldn't resist the spirit by which he speak. He spoke because his face was lit up like an angel. A lot of people getting lit in the church, but we need to get lit up by the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Clap your hands and thank God. The anointing makes the difference. You're not fighting your battles on your own strength. The anointing makes the difference on your prayers, on your praise, on your spirit, on your house. Notice the quali qualifications. He said in verse 32, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. What's that about? Romans chapter 8 said, They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. And then it ends by saying, They that are after the flesh cannot please God. Galatians 3 and verse 3 said, Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? What happens to people is when they get a little age and a little maturity and they get a little experience in attending church, they began in the spirit. They began leaning and depending upon the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But as you get older, you just learn how to do things. And he said, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh. There's a lot of people listening to me that started in the spirit, but now you're just doing your stuff in the flesh. When you started that ministry, you started that business, you started that career, you were connected to the anointing, you were connected to the spirit, but now have you gone so far that you're now leaning on the arm of the flesh? The scripture said, cursed is the man who leans to the arm of the flesh. John 6 and verse 63 said, the flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. It quickens you. That's called the anointing. I love the story the Bible said in 1 Samuel 16 that when Samuel was told by God, stop mourning over Saul. I'm going to anoint a new king. And he said, go down to Jesse's house. Take a bottle of oil. Take, a, take six quarts of oil and go anoint somebody, one of his sons. I'll show you who he is. And he goes down to Jesse's house. And the Bible said that they brought in seven of the boys and left one of them out in the field named David. And the scripture said, and I love this, it said that, that, that Samuel, when he saw Eliab, Eliab had a, a, a stature, he had a, a look to him that he was presidential. He had something about him that anybody looking at him, and even the scripture said this about him, the scripture said that, he, that he, his personal, his personal, preference was surely the Lord will anoint him. This is the prophet, but he's going by what you can see. And that's where that famous verse comes in. God's spirit quickened him and said, don't pour the oil on him because he looks like it and he's waiting on a promotion. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. And that's not the one. And he starts to pour the oil and the Holy Spirit says, don't pour the oil on him. And they bring seven of them in and he won't pour the oil on any of them. Now, if that had been me, I'd have, I'd have felt bad. I'd have put a little dab or something. But, but he, he said, I'm, I'm not going to. And I like his wording in King James. He said, I won't anoint this. 
I don't know what this is, but I'm not going to put my anointing on it. It looks good on the outside, but the heart isn't pure. The heart isn't right. The heart isn't clean. God looks at our heart. And he said, is there not anybody else in your house, Jesse? And Jesse said, well, I do have one other boy, but I don't think he's going to mount to much. He's out in the field. Now watch. What was he out in the field doing? He was out in the field singing songs. He was out in the field playing his harp and writing. And I could see it in my mind as one of the boys goes to retrieve him from tending the sheep. And he's jotting down. You know, he wrote the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh. Nobody out there. He's just worshiping in private. This is how you get anointed. He just worships God when nobody's looking. And sure enough, he calls him in, and when Samuel sees him, he gets quickened. And he pours the oil on him, and he says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. And the Bible said the anointing came on David from that day forward. Whew. There's something powerful that can happen. Wouldn't you like to leave this service and say, from that day forward, I never fight without the anointing. See, all of us have different gifts. All of us have different. I love the fact that when, when, when Saul said, hey, if you're going to go fight that giant, take my brass shield and take my armor and take my, all my sword and all that. He said, no, thank you. I'll just take this little, this little slingshot and this little, these five little rocks that I've got because I've got the anointing on it. I'd rather have the anointing on a little than a whole lot without the anointing. And you may not have the ability somebody else has. You may not have the gifting that somebody else has. But if you'll just say, God, here's what I've got. Would you anoint it and would you use it? You'd be amazed that there's no giant you won't face that won't fall when you come at him in the name of the Lord with the anointing. Because the anointing makes the difference. Clap your hands and praise the Lord. Oh, I'm feeling a little bit of my anointing now. Hallelujah. There is a difference when the anointing comes. There is a freedom when the anointing comes. There is an unction when the anointing comes. Man may be mad and poking across their arms and sucking their teeth, but they'll be looking crazy in a minute when the anointing comes on you because they can't stop you when you're anointed. They can't hold you down when you're anointed. The devil is afraid of you when you're anointed. Somebody raise your hands and say, anoint me with fresh oil. Fresh oil. We need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh anointing. I'm almost done, but let me keep preaching. He said, I'm going to anoint him in the midst of his brothers. And David was anointed. See, we lean on other things than the anointing. He said, it shall not be poured upon strangers. If you stay distant and far from God, don't expect the anointing. This is for chosen vessels. The anointing is a witness of the Holy Spirit of a sanctified life. Hebrews 10 and verse 15 said, He has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Spirit is a witness. When you see someone that is sanctified and the anointing is on their life, that's the witness of the Holy Spirit. I have anointed this one. He said in, Ecclesi in, in Ecclesiastes 9 and 8, let their garments always be white. Let their head lack no oil. He said, I want you to have white garments speaking of purity and because you're separated, because you're consecrated, because you're sanctified, because you have white garments, you'll have anointed heads. Purity always produces power. We've come to a time in this generation where the word sanctification makes people gag. They don't want to have nothing to do with being separate. They don't want to have nothing to do with being different from the world. But one thing that the anointing is attracted to is a person who is sanctified, set apart, consecrated, says my, my life is for Jesus Christ and I don't care what everybody else can do. I, if it's going to hinder my anointing, I don't need it. I don't want it. It's not enough. That for me, I want the anointing more than anything. Come on, somebody. 
Lean in and listen carefully. He said, and there will be a great penalty for anyone who tries to substitute the ingredients that I said had to be in the anointing. He said, don't substitute. Did you read that verse? He said, you shall not make another one like it and pretend that's the real thing. I don't want substitutes. We're living in an hour of substitutes in the body of Christ. And we think we can substitute the anointing of the Holy Spirit for other things when there is nothing that will get the job done like the anointing. In 2 Chronicles 12, the Bible said Rehoboam, when he had gold shields, they were stolen, and the, 300 of them, and he put them outside the temple. And the Bible said when they got stolen because they had backslidden, and, and the enemies came and stole them. He was afraid of the morale of what would happen to the people. And so he commanded that they bring brass shields, that they put guards out there so the people couldn't get too close to inspect. And then he said, polish the brass shields real good so that when the sun hits them from a distance, they'll still think that it's the gold, but it'll really be brass. I wonder how much of what we have in the church is brass shields. And we're just trying our best to imitate the real thing, which is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But there is no imitation that can compare to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it's here right now. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are bound. Acts 10 said, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost. And he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. When you get anointed, you'll go about. <laughs> when you get anointed, God will open doors for you. When you get anointed, they can't hold you down. You'll go about. You get the anointing on you, and the anointing will make things happen that you can't make happen. And God wants to anoint every person under the sound of my voice. You know, i got to close with this little story. But... Um, uh, I heard this week a, a, a man by the name of Raymond Culpepper. Uh, at the, uh, I heard him give this testimony. He's a powerful preacher and pastor down in Birmingham, Alabama. His daughter, this happened many years ago. His daughter was 14 years old, and she got in the car with a 16-year-old. They were just going to run down the road and get something to eat and come back. And they got in the car and something happened to the car and it broke down on the side of the road in the middle of the night and a stranger pulled up got out of the car forced the girls to get into his car put the pastor's pastor Culpepper's daughter in the back seat and the other girl in the front seat and sped away he started cursing he started saying mean things hateful things to them and the pastor's daughter noticed that over in a box on the side was a knife and was tape and was ropes. And she began to tremble and she said, Daddy, the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I began to pray in the Holy Spirit as the anointing came on me. And that girl began to pray in the Holy Ghost, pray under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. She said that man driving that car that was taking them off to do only God knows what he was going to do to them said, what's wrong with her? What's wrong with her? And the girl next to her said, that's the Holy Ghost. That's the anointing of God on her life. What, what's wrong with you? And then she started. And the man started saying, well, I can't stand this. Pulled the car over. Said, get out of my car. I ain't going to. I believe in the anointing. I believe that no weapon formed against us can prosper when we are anointed. We need the anointing in our schools. We need the anointing on our teachers. We need the anointing on our students. We need the anointing on our lives. Stand up on your feet and say, the anointing makes the difference.
Thank you so much for joining us today on Kingdom Connection. We never leave this broadcast without giving you the opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what it's all about. That's where joy is. That's where life is. Pray this prayer right where you are and let Jesus bring you abundant life. Say these words, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And today I surrender my life to your Lordship. I give you everything including my weaknesses, my failure, and yes, all of my sin. Cleanse me, wash me, and forgive me in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer that I prayed, and I want to encourage you to tell somebody, you know the Bible says that we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. Listen to this, you have a little part in it, and the word of our testimony. It means you need to testify. When you respond to what you hear on this telecast, it releases miracles into your life. So go online or call the number that's on the screen and let us know what God is doing in your life. Respond, you do what you can do, and I guarantee you on the other side, God's going to do what He can do, and that's going to be a good thing. God bless you. Marriage and families don't look the way they used to. Our families are under attack. As families everywhere are struggling to keep from falling apart, now like never before, we must stand up and fight for our families. Our prayers are the bow that sends our children, and they cannot soar without our prayers. For over three decades, Jensen Franklin has been taking a stand to fight for families. This month, when you partner with him in sharing God's love and compassion with hurting families, with your gift of any amount, we'll send you the message, God's hand on our house. Or with your gift of $75 or more, we'll send you this powerful message by Jensen Franklin, along with a custom promise box full of God's truths to declare over your family. You don't have to do this alone. Together, we can fight for our families. Don't wait. Go online to jensenfranklin.tv and take a stand to fight for your family. Before we leave the broadcast today, I really want to ask you to join me in taking a stand to fight for your family. As families and children across our nation are going back to school, we just believe in a season of fasting and prayer here at the ministry to call on God to place His hand upon our children and our families. So as you're praying, don't forget to send us the names of your loved ones. I mean it. This is not a gimmick. This is not something. We're going to pray over every name in your household that you send us. And then, you know, it's one thing when you pray, but when we join together, there's a covering over the whole house. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. This program has been sponsored by friends and partners of Kingdom Connection. We hope you've enjoyed this teaching by Jensen Franklin and thank you for your continued support of this ministry. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.